All right. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to my talk. Uh, my name is Ash Bacchus Clark, and I'm going to present a little virtual lecture, uh, talk, experience, if you will, to you for the next, I would say, hour. And then if anyone has questions or wants to engage in dialogue, we can figure out a way to do that because I would love to not feel like I'm just talking to a screen. <laughs> um, this is my first time doing a live stream. I usually talk at, you know, in real life, but things have changed drastically in the, in the past two to three weeks. And this is a new experience of um, talking and gathering and knowledge exchange and um, engaging. So I'm learning in real time and as I know we all are and um, I would love for this to be a time for us to think about what digital art, um, uh, knowledge, theory, science, technology, all of that, what that looks like moving forward because um, I think we're in an unprecedented time and this is a time for us to realize that the reset button was hit on everyone and we can figure out what the new world looks like. And, and that's a lot of what I'm interested in is, is what the future looks like, who's building the future, and how the tools that are here to assist us can be used to, to go forward. So thank you for joining me. Um, I also am going a little stir crazy in my, my self isolation. So <laughs> I also want to use this time to, who knows, tell jokes, get, get light, uh, figure out how we can be embodied in our living rooms or apartments or garages, wherever you find yourself. How can we get into our body and off the screen as well? So um, the title of my talk is called The Theater of the Mind, and um, I want to talk about how different fields of study uh, inform and engage with science, because that wasn't my experience uh, in my education. So my background is in molecular biology. Uh, I studied stem cells, developmental biology for years um, before making the transition into the art space. Um, and th having that background was something that uh, informs the work that I do now. Uh, it allows me to bring sort of a scientific rigor towards, you know, like more aesthetic and more conceptual topics. Um, all right, so let's see, let's jump into how this window capture is working. So if you guys have any issues, um, I can probably make these slides available somewhere, but they're really not that uh, important. I just wanted to have something to like visually orient ourselves as I go through this. And um, bear with me because I think I'm going to freeform this a little bit because I'm as I keep talking and thinking about things, I have ideas that are popping up. So um, hopefully there's a through line through it. Uh, but I think that the talk that I wanted to give doesn't feel as appropriate as it did a few weeks ago. So I gave the precursor of this talk in Amsterdam like two weeks before COVID was announced as a pandemic. And that felt different because I was in a physical space uh, talking to people who were doing research around feminist uh, science. So feminist neuroscience, feminist scientific methodologies, all of that really important work that's being done. But we were able to be in community and exchange in, in a physical space. And that was you know, re really at the beginning of this month, so not too long ago, and that felt like a lifetime because now, you know, like, I'm talking to the screen and I can't really see who's on the other side, but I can feel that there's a community here, and I'm hoping that um, more and more as we build these, these virtual communities that 
something um, greater comes out of it that we can bring back to uh, the physical once we're able to engage in that way again. So, um, okay. Also, just one more thing before I change the slide. Um, I am very interested in neuroscience and cognitive science and how that intersects with art and technology, you know, um, especially, especially how we're externalizing our memories to Google and to screens and to um, technology. And I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing, but I think it's something to be mindful and cognizant of and something that has to be in balance with um, the other types of deeper work that we do. Uh, because a lot, of, a lot of work that is augmented by technology becomes shallow work and we're not able to pierce that layer of shallowness to really get into the type of work that requires um, our full attention, our full synaptic power, uh, the plasticity of our minds in order to get done. So I'm gonna um, kind of loosely follow this outline. Um, these are topics that I've been thinking a lot about, uh, especially now as I find myself with, <laughs> with a lot of time to um, to think about things and you know my commute is no longer something that I have to schedule into my day so that frees up time to to think about time and to think about productivity and to think about how um, capitalism has really um, instilled itself into our bodies and how that memory, uh, that, that memory of like, we should be working, we should be productive, we should be in this sort of hustle gig mentality, how that can, um, how we can transform that energy. And, um, you know, especially those who are in the healthcare fields and who are on the front lines of what we're going through right now, like how, how can we, uh, impact the, the people that most need to be impacted and supported right now? Um, how can we turn our attention away from productivity uh, and thinking about what that means um, from a, a more cognitive perspective and, and use that to actually um, make ourselves available? So first I'm gonna talk about some case studies. So why I became interested in, in uh, emerging tech and neuroscience and art and all of that. So, um, you know, what, what was the impetus for that? And I'm gonna go into some statistics about uh, women of color specifically in, uh, in STEM, so science, art, and technology. And then I'm gonna just go into the science. Like what, what, what I do always comes back to the science, the questions that I have. Um, who's making experiments, who's carrying out the research, what types of questions are being asked while this research is uh, taking place, how does technology fit into, into research, and how, does art, how do artists inform the sorts of methodological questions that are asked in the research space. Um, next, I'm gonna go into time, so we're gonna get a little nebulous with it. I really love uh, thinking about metaphysics and, um, you know, the way that science has treated uh, spirituality, uh, physical space, time, um, uh, physics, all of that. How, how have we lost touch with the ephemeral and the non-real, I'm going to call it. Um, and then we're going to go into mind, time, and then futurism. So I'm going to leave it oriented around black speculative futures, um, but also indigenous futures, Latinx futures. Um, right now we're at a precipice of what the future looks like, you know, and for right now it kind of feels dystopian <laughs> because you, I don't know about you guys, but every morning I wake up and I pick up my phone and I'm on Instagram and I'm on Twitter and I'm, I'm checking all of the various telegram groups I'm in and all I see is different conspiracies about COVID. Uh, the death rates, the statistics, um, the drones that are, you know, spraying, sanitizing uh, liquid all over the streets and other, you know, just 
all of these things that like, you know, we read about in Octavia Butler and Ursula K. Le Guin, like, and all these sci-fi writers who were looking towards this dystopian future and it feels like we're living it, but that really uh, dismisses the sort of individual acts of resistance and beauty that are coming out of this time, this pause. So I'm gonna leave it on that, uh, try to leave it on a, on an upward note instead of this sort of valley that we find ourselves in. All right. So women in STEM, um, this has been a topic for the past, you know, I would say 20 years, um, as far as figuring out how we get more women in STEM, how we get more, um, women to stay in STEM, what that looks like. But I mean, yes, it goes much, much farther back than that. But I would say in the past 20 years, um, as far as really putting action towards this question, these statistics, um, you know, when I was in school, this was a, a chart that I seen uh, going around. And of course, this this graphic is from 20, uh, 2019, but I remember seeing this when I went to college and decided that I wanted to be a science major. You know, like there aren't that many women uh, that I saw as my professors that I saw getting tenure at universities that I saw going into industry. Uh, so in the major, there were a lot of women, but you know, the closer you get to graduation, people start dropping off. And then after that, the people who are actually getting hired and um, f fairly compensated in this field looked even more abysmal. So uh, this is this is the chart that was in my mind and a lot of um, my peers' minds. It's like from the statistics, it looks like that we don't belong in this field. And adding the factor of uh, ethnicity, race cultural identification into that, those figures uh, look even more abysmal. So if we stay in science, who's going to hire us? Uh, who's going to take us serious? Are we going to get to the, to the positions that give us uh, security and longevity? Um, you know, what does that look like? How do you, how do you fight back against statistics and prove to yourself that you belong somewhere. Uh, and this is something that was top of my mind uh, when I decided to leave science because it felt pointless to continue going and to have an uphill battle every day just to, you know, not be able to make a living wage in a lot of instances. I know a lot of postdocs, um, <laughs> you know, I was, I was, uh, in that position of doing something really hard and then not being able to pay rent. So h how does that encourage you to want to continue working hard? Um, and slowly these figures are changing, but not much. So what my question is, um, you know, as a, as a person who's been out in the world, out of school for several years, how do we look at those young women who are um, in science and technology, how do we look at, you know, non-binary folks, queer folks, all of these um, people who don't fit into this sort of, um, this very uh, homogenous, <laughs> for lack of a, a, of a better way of framing this, but fit into this idea of what a scientist is. Um, how do we how do we change that and how can we use community support how can we use uh the arts so theory um how do we use literature how do we use these different disciplines that do have that representation and have the identity uh, of you are, you have something con to contribute, worked into the core uh, of, of those fields, how do we do the same thing in science? So um, 
this is another thing. So, um, leaving science that, that, those are the things that stuck in my mind. So my, my background after leaving science led me to marketing, brand marketing, um, storytelling, uh, thinking about engaging on the front lines. Like when I hear about grocery store, people who work in grocery stores right now through this pandemic, people who are working in retail, people who are on the front lines who are tied to uh, an hourly or, or physicality, so showing up in physical space in order to make a living right now, you know, like that was my reality after leaving science, customer facing. Um, I really, in lab, was lacking that sort of human to human interaction. And so going a different direction um, allowed me to, to be in front of people and to see the humanity and see what people were going through. And um, that is really important. And I think that's something that's also very challenging to to have um, in the scientific field. It's like, you know, like, where do you go to see what every every day looks like for people, the quotidian um, and um, that for me is something else that can be addressed within the sciences um, and so all of that to say when I was working in my marketing job I would read psychology today all the time and one day I saw this article that was published and you know touted as this peer-reviewed um, well-studied critical science piece in psychology today and the title is why are black women less physically attractive than other women okay so psychology today is a, a media outlet that captures the public imagination around psychology and um, psychologizing everything in our lives now so it's it's like in the same vein as like these Cosmo um, magazine quizzes that you can take to see if you need to see a therapist. Or now we have like these BuzzFeed our, um, quizzes that we can do online to like self-diagnose. And, and this journal is within that same vein. Granted, you know, they hire journalists or artists or sorry, or, um, you know, scientists who can publish and who have, you know, institutional support or recognition but this is still not the type of thing that you know as a young black woman I see oh why are black women less physically attractive than other women and see that as a subjective statement and so um, after after reading this statement it launched me and my collaborators into this um, project of looking at how media portrays black women specifically, but also just across the sort of gender and um, cultural spectrum. How, how is media, especially emerging media, shaping the way that we engage with each other and shaping the way that we uh, identify and view ourselves? So this, um, this, researcher who has since, I think, been let go of <laughs> his position, um, who published this article, but like it's out there and the internet has memory and, you know, we also hold on to these memories. So challenging, um, challenging people to think through what something like this means, um, is a top of mind for me. And so, now I'm going to kind of transition into talking about uh, my artistic practice, my research practice, and how all of these things, these these statistics that I um, talked briefly about fit into that, and also how it led me to start thinking about um, womanism or black feminism and black feminist theory into the work that I'm doing. And more than anything, um, the projects that I do, the projects that I collaborate on are really a curriculum. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I know 
or I'm an expert on black feminist theory because I'm really just coming to it now from a, a, a perspective of curiosity and a, a perspective of learning and collaborating with and engaging with other people. Um, and also to say this, I know that you know, we have all of these words that become loaded. So like womanism, feminism, um, these things that might be off-putting for certain uh, audiences because of the society that we live in. Um, I was on a panel with someone in Berlin at the end of um, January and actually like a really interesting uh, conversation came out of it around femphobia and soft power and softness and how that is not the way that we are taught to engage in the world with through this softness through this empathy this compassion we're taught to really harness and have dominion over and um, that has its place I think there needs to be a balance between those two energies but I uh but it's really thinking about how our technology, um, how our institutions, how our work can benefit from having a different take, a more softer take uh, in terms of structure and power. So this was me when I was a little, <laughs> a little grad school person. Obama had just won the election and... Um, when I think back to who I was then, uh, wanting to be in science, wanting to find my place there and, and not seeing myself, and now be understanding how it, you can do research outside of academia and outside of a lab, um, I think that that's something that is interesting that I would love to keep, continue talking about and working on for people who find themselves in a lab who, who want to have, you know, a, a more dynamic practice and um, how that doesn't mean that you have to give it up altogether. All right, so um, I wasn't really gonna talk about this too much because this was a project from um, late 2016, early 2017, but I was talking to uh, my collaborator who made this with me uh, a couple days ago, and it struck me that this is this project kind of, um, I guess, prompted or or began my interest in thinking about speculative futurism and speculative design and virtual reality, and. Um, it's, it was a, a sandbox, if you will, for, for what my reality is right now. Uh, and I'm sure that's true for a lot of people of thinking about um, how we can hold on to this visceral, this visceral or cellular memory of um, history, especially as history is being rewritten and lost and um, confused through, um, through social media, through technology, through all of these things. And what does that look like when a group of empowered, strong, uh, in this case, black women, but women, um, queer people, people who have been relegated to the margins, uh, make something of this, of this, uh, this ephemeral time that we're in. So this project is called Neurospeculative Afrofeminism. Uh, we debuted it at the 2017 Sundance Film Festival. So I made this with an uh, interaction design studio called Hyphen Labs. And um, back then we were, we were in a time of, of, I would say just like the sort of rampant mediafication of black death and um, this was a way of externalizing the emotions that came along with seeing um, just the, the constant um, sharing and uh, 
repetition of images of black death and thinking like the vernacular of trigger warnings and safe spaces, all of that was like coming into the public consciousness when we made this project. And um, it's a four part project. So looking at using virtual reality, uh, speculative design, um, cognitive impact research and physical installations to ask the question of where are all the black women in science? Um, where are all of the elders and storytellers and what is their role as the keeper of the future, uh, the keeper of the past and the builder of new worlds? So um, I'm going to show you a trailer. So it started off with the objects. So we created a roster of objects. Um, and all of this is like, if you guys are interested, I don't know how this works, but maybe I can do this after the fact, but I can drop some links down in the bio because I don't want to spend too much time digging into one project or another. But if you guys are interested, there's a lot of um, documentation about the different parts so you can see the objects and stuff online. But um, these objects were sort of a, a starter kit for the main character who you meet in VR to go through this sort of uh, dystopian world. And she uh, is using these, these different physical objects that we made. So one was a visor, a scarf that confuses computer vision algorithms, um, like a transparent sunscreen because, you know, <laughs> when we lose contact with the sun or it becomes brighter or, uh, you know, just thinking through different scenarios about the environment, what that looks like. Um, and so the idea is that she ends up in this, this lab, which is a covert hair salon. So it's a neurocosmetology lab. So it was, um, it's this, this nebulous space out in the ether of, that was really like um, a refuge for the, the main characters in the story. But um, it's a reimagination of a hair salon. <laughs> so you go in and you think you're going to get your hair done, but you're really going to get your brain optimized. And um, this is where the sort of neuroscience or speculative part comes in. It's like, we have this technology, we have these uh, brain uh, computer interfaces. We have these techniques called transcranial stimulation that are very real technologies that are being used right now. And some people are trying to figure out alternative uses for them. So can we use some of these technologies to optimize ourselves, to make ourselves smarter, to make ourselves more productive, uh, to give us a comparative advantage? And I was in researching this, um, you know, we were seeing that a lot of um, people in the tech space in Silicon Valley were using some of these uh, hardware technologies, but also nootropic drugs. So doing nootropic stacking and taking different, uh, like, you know, like micro dosing LSD, doing all of these things that really like get you into uh, something called flow states. So when you're able to hyper focus uh, more readily, and, you know, this is not anything new, but to have this be the new norm was what um, prompted this project. Because, you know, instead of trying to modify this technology to fit on our heads, which, like, as you can see, I have locks, like, it's very hard to get censored to skin contact um, if these tools aren't used or tested on someone that has hair like you or who you know even wears glasses to put on a, a VR headset things like that so like critiquing the technology in real time um, but also seeing how virtual reality can be a tool for uh, for training hyper focus or for for immersing you in a story so yeah, I'm going to play a trailer from it, but this is you can go and download the VR on um, the Oculus Store if you're interested in viewing it. Let me know if you can hear the audio. It might be.
that's the trailer. <laughs> um, so, as I said, we um, debuted this project at the Sundance Film Festival, and the idea behind it was to think about performative research or research in public spaces. So, when we did this piece, and when we show it now, um, we build out a physical installation in addition to what you see when you put the headset on. So it's like you're doubly immersed. So you walk into the physical space and you see an exact replica of what you see when you put on the VR headset. And, um, you know, we prime you for what you're going to see when you go into the experience. And after you come out of it, um, we actually did this twice. So at the Sundance Film Festival in 2017 and then at South by Southwest also in 2017. But we uh, partnered with an anthropologist to do some demographic research about what it actually is like to see black women in positions of power, empowered embodiment, uh, if you will because in the experience you're embodied in the body of a young black woman and you go through the experience in her body. And um, the reason that we chose to do this is because there's a lot of studies uh, um, that show that virtual embodiment, especially if you embody an audience in the body of a black avatar and then give them agency over that body. So if they can like, if there's hand tracking with virtual reality, you know, they can move their hands and see that in a mirror, uh, or you can look down and see it when you have the headset on, or you can move your head, which is what we did. So that tricks your brain into thinking, okay, I'm controlling this avatar body. Maybe this is my body. Um, and also if you're interested I think what might be interesting is to maybe like do kind of a syllabus or curriculum if anyone's interested in this. I'm in, I know I'm interested. So. <laughs> uh, just like collecting all the the kind of like uh, biographies or research that went into this. But like we wanted to see if um, you know showing people an embodied experience if that could somehow be a proxy for engaging with uh, black women in a physical space or, you know, or if you're, if you're, in, if you are um, engaged in a home life or a community life or a work life where you don't really have any diversity around you, if it's, you know, everyone looks the same at your office or everyone looks the same in your community, um, if you go and do an experience in VR and engage with um, content made by people who you might not get to engage with every day, or if you see avatars who um, have a different uh, implied live ex lived experience as you, if that will somehow um, be a motivator for changing the way that you engage with actual people. And um, so we did this research and uh, here's actually one of the build outs of what it looked like at a gallery. But you go in there and, and you, you have an actual space to have this experience. And um, one of our collaborators actually did her dissertation on this and is publishing a paper on, on what she found in showing this pieced school children, so young girls uh, who, who were able to see themselves in VR and see themselves in positions of power, if that somehow changed the sort of internalized implicit bias that they experienced. And um, very, very um, interested in doing ongoing research around this or how showing um, you know, these more embodied experiences can be a tool for not only addressing, you know, embodying people who aren't black into a, a black avatar in this instance, or, you know, a, a Latinx avatar, or just some uh, an avatar that is outside of the group that 
you culturally identify with, um, if that somehow changes the way that you engage with other groups of people. So that's one, one avenue of it. The other avenue is, you know, showing people who don't necessarily see themselves in virtual reality or emerging tech or in positions of power, showing them this piece and having an embodied experience and having that be a point of visibility to show that, hey, you exist and this is what's possible for you. So if that somehow can be um, quantified or, or researched. So this is a team Python Labs, uh, we made this piece and it's really cool. So if you guys want to check it out and check out their work, because it's awesome. Um, okay, so next, I'm going to talk about a project that I'm currently working on. It's called A Bird in the Mind. So keeping with the theme of neuroscience and cognition uh, has led me to this next project, which is still in... Um, in the writing phase. <laughs> so this project is about Alzheimer's and how Alzheimer's and dementia related um, illnesses are viewed and the stories that we tell and the fears that we have around losing our memories and especially losing our memories in a time of social media, now thinking about social distancing and isolation um, in a time where we have populations that are aging more rapidly than, um, you know, they have children being born. So we have Italy as an aging population, um, Japan, um, Germany, all of these countries that are are faced with, with seeing now what it looks like to age in place. So like to age in your home or to um, not have children to, to take care of you or to not have your physical environment be um, be what you need as you as you transition um, from this, this like bulk of, I am a productive adult who's paying taxes, who are doing all these things. And now, you know, I am in like this last phase of my life. Like what, what does that look like? And so A Bird in the Mind is also going to be an immersive media piece that looks at Alzheimer's, especially Alzheimer's in black women, because if you look at the statistics, and actually I forgot we can do this, so this is going to be fun, but like uh, statistics of black women with uh, alls, Let's see if I spelled that right, <laughs> oh, okay, so from the, the research that I've done so far is um, black women are over indexed and over represented in Alzheimer's and dementia related um, diseases. And <clears throat> when we think about this, you know, what, why, why is there this, this disproportionate effect um, in black communities? And I'm talking specifically from a US perspective. I know this is, uh, this talk right now is through HAL in Berlin, which is where I've been living for the past six months. But um, this is a very US-centric uh, statistic right now, especially in the quote-unquote stroke belt of the US, which is the South. So my mother is w born and raised in New Orleans, or in Jennings, Louisiana, which is, you know, outside of New Orleans. And she, that is in the stroke belt. Um, you know, the sort of the seat or, or bottom of the U.S., the southern states is the stroke belt. And so, like, these women are, um, are more susceptible to getting Alzheimer's, and I'm interested and curious to know why. Is it stress? Is it environmental factors? Is it all of these things? And so this is where 
uh, thinking about a womanist framework and intersectionality, how that fits within research questions and fits within how we structure research um, is what I'm trying to trying to work through in tandem with doing this project. Um, and so I have a lot of friends who are, um, you know, interested in literature and the, the humanities, especially, especially digital humanities and thinking about how we can create tools for scientists and um, researchers who are building studies but who don't necessarily have a framework or language to think through how some of these topics of intersectionality fit within how you're building research questions. And for me, I think um, art can be a bridge for this, um, you know, showing and telling. So how can art be a bridge between institution and research and access? Um, so I'm going to go back to the slides here. Um, and the way that I'm thinking about this, just from some of the research and reading that I've been doing, there are a lot of architecture firms who are interested in building these sort of memory environments or building spaces that are specifically for um, patients that have Alzheimer's. But when we think about architecture and like actually being able to access a space like this, like then it brings privilege into the mix. So who, as you age, uh, who is privileged enough to be able to go into a space that's been de designed by, you know, a, a formidable architect? And, you know, every part has been thought about and considered. And <clears throat> when we think about the people who have been most impacted, it usually doesn't align with being able to afford something like this. And so, uh, what I'm interested in is how this could be made digital and how this can be made um, accessible through tools that uh, anyone has access to. How, can, how do libraries get involved? How can we look at some of these public spaces and institutions uh, as a model for you know, thinking about how architecture, how um, you know, black women's health, uh, queer health, trans health, um, all of these groups who uh, are, are represented in this sort of aging population but have needs that don't fit within the dominant frame. So A Bird in the Mind is a story about um, an older neuroscientist who was um, diagnosed with Alzheimer's and she tries to hide it from her, her family. And she does a good job at this by hiding her memories in different objects around um, her house. And her family has no idea until after she's passed away and they go and they start collecting these memories in her space. So it's, a, it's another speculative sci-fi story it's, a, it's about um, how our built environment, our lived space holds our memories, but also how we externalize our memories to objects um, and how these tools uh, are left as sort of reminders for our families and for our society and for our friends once we're no longer here. And so this piece um, is going to be a theater piece, but also the physical aspect of it, if we ever are able to do this again. If not, it's going to be digital, but like using artificial intelligence to um, sort of have a conversation with speculative architecture and how, how architecture doesn't have to be physical, um, but it can also be um, the architecture of our minds, the architecture of our brains, and um, I really like this sort of transition. So when I was working at Hyphen Labs, I was able to like collaborate with architects and like really think about like my brain doesn't work <laughs> structurally like that, but our brains, you know, for the past um, 
God, I, I don't even know how to talk about time with this theory, but thinking about how our minds, I, I would guess since the beginning of the scientific revolution, but our minds are really thought of as being structural and mechanical and mathematical. And now we're starting to work through that and see that that's not actually the way our brains work. You know, there's like undulations and there's starts and stops and there's nebulous and there's, you know, all of these things that have a more malleable language rather than a rigid language um, is the, the way that, uh, you know, cognitive science and neuroscience is engaging with some of these questions. So um, one of the questions that is guiding me to, in this new project is why are we in so much pain? Um, how, how can pain and anxiety and stress uh, change structurally the way our brains are able to function? Um, how it follows us through our entire lives and how we can look at it and address it. And um, especially now, I think, as we find ourselves alone with our thoughts more, um, alone with our surroundings, and uh, if you're privileged enough to have uh, an apartment or a space that you live in right now, how we, how probably this is, you know, first for a lot of people that we really are alone with our thoughts and alone with the things that sort of keep us up at night or scare us. and. My question is where, is, where does the pain come from? When can we look at our anxiety and our fears, which a lot are, are societal and structural, when can we look at them and begin to transform them? And how, how do we do that in collaboration with our screens, with technology? Um, Okay, so I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I, w I started um, thinking about this talk and um, I guess working through it at a neuroscience conference that I went to. And uh, in prepping for that, I started doing a little bit of research about how feminism and neuroscience and um, you know, having a more expansive view of what it means to do research, how that came to be. And so I found this quote by Gina Ripton, who's a cognitive neuroscience, uh, neuroscientist in the UK. And just thinking about gendering and the language that we use to talk about things and the language we don't use to talk about things, because I think, um, we like to think we like to think of, of research and science as being null, not having any sort of um, identi identity to it. You know, it's pure facts. It's like these are the facts, these are the categories. It's a very materialist way of, of looking at science is, is what has been um, the um, I get the norm. So we don't think about things in terms of, of, of the differences um, between subjects. So in our gendered world, she says, shapes everything from an educational policy, social hierarchies, to relationships, to self-identity, well-being, and mental health. And um, this is a, if that sounds like a familiar 20th century social conditioning argument, it is, except now, coupled with knowledge of the brain's plasticity, which we have only been aware of in the past 30 years. So this brain plasticity is, um, this is what I've been thinking a lot about too, about how our, brain, our brains remain plastic for so long, um, you know, up into our 70s and 80s. So we, we remain open and able to learn and able to hold different truths in our minds. So, um, you know, we can keep learning new things. We can keep uh, pursuing higher forms of, of cognition and knowing. And that doesn't stop, you know, it doesn't stop when we leave school. It doesn't stop when we 
have a family or, or go out into the world. Like this is something that is happening in real time. And I think that there is a new normal that can happen uh, the more we wake up to the fact that we are plastic and we have an infinite capacity to change our minds, to be, to be swayed, to be open to new ideas and to really have this sort of softness and soft dynamic power come in and take over, um, giving, uh, giving people who have been outside of, of in the margins a chance to come in and pursue a different way of building society. And that leads me to uh, Octavia Butler, so <laughs> Mother Butler. This is, for me, where it started. Um, so I was born and raised in Pasadena, California, and that, that is where Octavia Butler uh, was also born and raised. So um, growing up just like a few doors down from where she lived and existed and where her papers are. And I don't know how many of you on this call are familiar with like Afrofuturism or black speculative futurism, but um, Octavia Butler's writing is very, very uh, prescient for this time that we're living in now. It almost, <laughs> you would almost say prolific or um, like she saw what was coming. And um, it's interesting because when we think about literature and we think about um, we think about artists and we think about the way that imagination and storytelling works its way into the fabric of um, our existence, it wasn't until um, you know well into my twenties that I, I started understanding the contributions of uh, of black women in this space and it it set me down this kind of path of, of continuing to see of like people who come from a culture that has traditionally been like dispossessed or, or kept on the outside of how how those voices inform or show us where we're going and, and in a way of like showing us where we're going 20, 30 years before we get there because this is what's happening in these communities. And so, you know, we're, we're going through a time right now of like, this is an unprecedented time in the Western world, but like people have been going through stuff like this in, you know, uh, in poor communities in communities where poverty is the daily norm. This is an everyday way of life. And, how how do we remember that and how do we hold that that knowing uh, i'm not going to say empathy because i think in that friction in that tension comes um c comes resilience uh and not resilience in the way that you don't recognize and understand pain but resilience in that like there are acts of resistance that people are doing to to continue living and to continue to find joy throughout these um, these situations and circumstances that have been erected around them and us. <laughs> I'm, you know, some of these things are also my lived experience. But like um, how how those acts of resistance can be scaled up and multiplied. I'm also thinking a lot about um, you know how neuroscience and philosophy fits in and also like broadening my education of people who uh, uh, from a more global perspective, if you will. So this is Thomas Metzinger and he is a philosopher, uh, cognitive scientist in Germany. And the way that he thinks about embodiment is, you know, recontextualizing this idea of the self and how do we engage with this idea of the self uh, when we don't know what the what the self in the world looks like anymore um, and what I mean by that is 
if we are so used to um, externalizing and engaging and being outgoing and open, what does this new self look like when we are inside, when we are faced with our, our mirror and our shadow, or if you're you know, in, in the house with a partner or your children, um, what is this new way of knowing them that's coming out? Like I know a lot of people who are, this is the first time they've ever had to spend this much time with their children because we externalize education to schools um, as a way of you know, getting children ready for this sort of corporatocracy, this corporate way of being. And we don't know how to be with ourselves or with our kids or with our family, with our mothers, with all of these things. So how is this pause a time to come and understand community and how the self fits within that community? Um, and so like going along this idea of embodiment, um, I have been thinking also a lot about D. Fox Harrell over at MIT's work on the Avatar dream. Um, I think actually, so it's the, it's the Avatar dream, but also he talks a lot about um, these different virtual identities that we have. Because when you think about, um, you know, the fact that we are all doing this now, we're talking to our screen, um, we are engaging with people on, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and we have a different avatar for each of those things, right? So like my, who I am on Instagram is not the same as who I am on LinkedIn, it's not the same as who I am on Twitter. And um, the way D. Foxrell talks about it is that all of these, we have like, God, maybe 100, 200 virtual identities, these virtual, these little avatars that exist in the virtual world as us, but they aren't us. So how is this, this fractured self now existing when now we're engaging through all of these, these different avatars of who we are? Um, and it's interesting to think about that too, because then that means we can be whoever we want to be. And that means that we have the ability every day to be something else, to be something different. And, um, but when you peel back all of the layers of that, uh, if, if we don't understand who the self is, um, you know, when we are by ourselves, then those fractured identities lead us away from a centeredness. Um, I also am, am thinking about that in terms of virtual reality and virtual embodiment um, because that, that the technology aside, so if you don't have a headset or you know VR isn't really your thing or anything like that, that's um, a little bit beside the point that I want to try to make here, but being embodied or, or having an embodied experience, be that through a screen, be that through meditation, be that through, um, let's say, getting into a flow state, if you will, of like writing or doing something creative, a time where you, are, you have hyper-focus on something. Um, if that, that virtual sense of embodiment becomes our new normal, um, how, how do we, how do we begin to engage, uh, in our day-to-day -day lives as that and through that? So, you know, now we're all on Zoom for those of us who have work or whose work has transitioned from being, um, you know, at your office, at your corporate office to now you're in your living room and you're on Zoom now and like, your colleagues see into your house, which, you know, they've probably never seen before. Or for those of us who have never worked from home before and don't know how to use our screen, this is, our vir this is a virtual uh, self that's now enacting. And, like, who we thought, if you, the way that you thought you knew your colleagues at the office is now, it looks very different because now you see them in another context. Like, you know... I have to remind myself every morning to brush my teeth or put on clothes, you know, like this is this, this Ashley that is, um, you know, finding myself, uh, trying to make sense of the world right now and still engage as if things 
were to go back to the way that they were, um, the question that I would like to pose to all of you who are listening who, or who will listen in the future, what does that look like and how, how do we bring down the veil of our virtual identity so that it has some semblance of vulnerability or, or humanness? How, do, how can we add the layer of humanity that exists when you f can feel and see and touch someone into um, existing through this screen? All right, so <laughs> enough waxing on. Hopefully all of those ideas can come together and coalesce in some way. But um, those, are, those are some of the research questions that um, are informing some of the work that I'm doing. I've also been writing some articles and trying to think about uh, computational biology. So going back into like pure, pure science without really thinking about emerging media or emerging tech and how it fits into it, but um, thinking about biology and how, um, how our bodies are being impacted by this new virtual future and how we can add intersectionality and um, a feminist framework into, um, into our bodies. So I'm really thinking a lot about CRISPR and genomics, even now with COVID, like thinking about the viral genome and how we talk about genetics and how it's been used historically to subjugate and to oppress and to, um, you know, facilitate genocides. And there is a, a real moment for those who are working in tech ethics and bioethics and all of these different fields to think about how we can hold big tech accountable for um, thinking and enacting and working through uh, the ethical frameworks of technology. And um, so I wrote this piece for a really cool publication called In Excess World, and they're based in Amsterdam. So it's called Preparing for Our Vital Digital Future. And this was, you know, written in December. So this was long before any of this happened. And uh, I was in the living room watching Pandemic and watching, um, I think it's called A Natural Selection on Netflix. And really looking at the way that uh, media and um, journalists and all of these these different um, communicators are, are thinking about and talking about the the future of um, biology and genetics and um, Vi uh, viruses and globalization and things like that and you know how we can bring the language from this this scientific jargon and this this very industry specific jargon into a place where it can be received by a, a wider audience a wider population um, so also um, now that we all are able to engage online and engage with uh, media and technology, the thing is, is now everyone has become an expert. And I'm seeing this um, in all of the groups where I'm s seeing people come up with theories about um, you know, how coronavirus was engineered or what was, or you know, who knew about it, where it originated from. Um, and the thing is, is that we have so much information coming at us, it's hard sometimes to discern what's true from what isn't. And in that discerning, in that process of, you know, everyone uh, having this sort of platform to say things and this like inundation of information, how do we parse apart what we should be engaging with and what we should be critically questioning. Um, so if anyone's interested in reading this piece, I can also drop the link on here, but um, 
this is a time for us to to rethink our relationship with information and um, teaching ourselves how to spot misinformation and how to uh, engage and, and to push back on something that we know probably doesn't feel right, doesn't sound right, the sources are off, all of that. Like, how do we how do we begin to do that and how do we hold, you know, our family and friends accountable or how do we um, give give accurate um, tools for discerning what is true from what isn't? All right, so this was, I'm not going to really talk about this because this is kind of more um, related to the science of how Alzheimer's is functioning in our brains. But I put this up here because this is an avatar that um, one of my friends made uh, a few years ago that never actually made it into a piece. But this has me thinking about, you know, as we as we start engaging in the digital, like, how do we begin to sculpt ourselves and sculpt our identities in this in this space so that uh, our avatars can begin to act as us and through us? Um, so, whew, it's 2.06, guys. We have 30 minutes. I'm going to try to wrap this up in, like, the next, I guess, um, 10 minutes. And then if anyone has questions, I don't even know how to see if someone's asking me questions. Let's see. Oh, wow. A lot of people are saying, hey, things. If you guys have any questions, you can drop them here. I can, like, actually see what's going on. But let me take that off the screen. Um... I'd like to end on a note of talking about uh, networks and disruption and um, sort of like more of, uh, I'm not going to say like a bit uh, blockchain or crypto sort of currency leaning, but I want to talk about like decentralized networks and um, how we can be, com we can be supporting each other right now and, and communicating in a distributed way. Uh, so I'm a part of like, a, a lot of telegram and like WhatsApp groups and, um, uh, I, I would say contemplative spaces that are acting like a support system now. And I'm hoping that all of you guys that are watching this have that sort of support happening for you as well. But what I see is that people are, are, um, picking up picking up the uh, slack for the way that some of our governments are, are not supporting us in the way that we probably, you know, weren't expecting that or anything, but it's just like a real lack of humanity that's being shown right now. And like, I see like people in my community picking up and, and being that sort of support and it has me wondering how we do more of that and how we can have these sort of global uh, nodes, if you will, of, of collectivism that come together and act as a support and reach out for people who might not have that, who might not be able to distance themselves without being isolated. And um, that is the real power of technology, the real power of um, you know, like old technology, like picking up the phone and checking in on your neighbor or, you know, leaving a note card or, um, checking in on someone that you haven't talked to in a long time for, you know, getting on a call and just kind of like being open and, and free flowing and seeing where it leads to, because that sort of relationship building, that getting to know that, uh, unearthing is is where the type of um, hmm, the type of power the type of of centering that I think we could use as a as an entire world belongs right now um, it's not thinking about how productivity or how 
um, getting things done. You know, I've seen all these like Twitter posts of like this time, you know, like, um, you know, some old dude in antiquity used a, whatever plague that was happening in the 16, 1700s to make this scientific theory. Like, that's great. If that's what, if you guys want to sit there and theorize, you know, about some physics, uh, concept that hasn't been figured out yet or if you want to write a book like please do that if you want to make music but if you don't have the energy to do that right now like that is okay it is okay to be scrolling through your your Instagram feed it's okay to like have to go into a room and close the door it's okay to take a nap it's okay to do it's like okay to give yourself permission to do all of these things um, because like, who knows how long we're in this for, and we have to find a way to, like, keep this sort of centeredness and groundedness through this, and, um, a lot of this, uh, a lot of this questioning and this, um, like, this cross-pollination between science and art and, um, contemplation and uh, questioning and storytelling really kind of circles in on this idea of what it means to be human and how we can divorce this this being human uh, with the way that we've seen the industrialization of this humanity of like always having to be on or answering our phones or answering an email or uh, checking in or tweeting or publishing an article, um, you know, how, how do we reset that? And if this isn't the time, then when is the time? When is this time to really think about putting into action some of these things that we wish uh, that our modern society would allow more time for? These are just pictures of like Neuron, uh, neurons and <laughs> brains that I think look really cool. Like, look at this. This is what is inside of us. Like, it's really interesting to think about. Like, um, I'm going to leave. I'm going to end it on a, a note of mycelium. So I'm super interested in, like, mycelial networks. And th that's, like, mycelial networks are, are the, the, f the networks of organization that um, are under our soil surface that support uh, fungus and mushrooms to grow and these networks also uh, communicate and engage with trees and plants and uh, a lot of people call this the like internet of the earth and so like this is us this is this is who we are we are like little nodes of mycelium able to connect um, like right now I'm talking to you from the west coast of the United States, the Pacific Northwest, uh, and I'm connected to a node at Howe in Berlin, which I know a lot of people there. This is, you know, almost 10, 13 p.m. there. It's uh, 2, 13 p.m. for me, for all my folks in uh, New York. You know, it's you're just ending your day there. In London, it's, you know, 9 p.m., like right now you're connected to all of these people around the globe who are listening, all the people in the future who may or may not listen. I don't know. <laughs> like maybe I'm just rambling on, but like it's interesting to think about posterity and uh, the sorts of interactions that we have and um, that we can engage with um, during these times. And I didn't really get to think about or talk about the theories of, of time and how, um, you know, the concept of time is loosening now because we don't have those, those signifiers and identifiers of the changing of time except out of our window now. So, you know, I've always had the, this kind of theory that, well, not theory, it's true, like time is a construct. So what does that look like now? Um, how can we refocus and... and reimagine uh, the structures that we have around ourselves so that we can start being creative and ideating uh, the world that we want to live in. So I think I'm gonna end it there and I'll try to figure out, maybe I can do it from my 
other screen that I have down here <laughs> to see if anyone has questions that they want to ask or if you guys have anything you want me to clarify. But I think I'll end it there. And I just wanted to say thank you guys for tuning in. And there we go.